Hello, everybody. Welcome to Beer Smith Podcast number 67. Got a great show for you today, a special show. Gordon Strong is going to be on talking about hop techniques. I think you'll enjoy that very much. Uh, today's reminder, I'm going to actually talk about the Beer Smith book. It's called Home Brewing with Beer Smith. It's been out for uh, over a year now, but it's a collection of my articles. So if you enjoy uh, reading some of the articles that I sent out via my newsletter, I think you'd probably enjoy the printed form as well. And you can get that both for the Kindle and from Amazon in printed form. And again, it's called Home Brewing with Beer Smith by Bradley Smith. And now without further ado, let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Gordon Strong, who's president of the Beer Judge Certification Program. He's a three-time Ninkazi Award winner. He's winner of the AHA Governing Committee Lifetime Achievement Award, author of the book, Brewing Better Beer, and my good friend. Gordon, it's great to have you on the show. It's great to be back, Brad. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate you being here. I think this is your, what, third, fourth time? At least. <laughs> yeah, well, we're up to, I think we're on 67, something like this, episode 67. So, uh, so That's today awesome. we're... Yeah, it is great, actually. So today we're going to do a, a bit of an on around the world discussion about hop techniques, uh, which I know is a topic that you're passionate about. Um, and I was wondering if you could, uh, first of all, explain to us why hop techniques are so important for making great beer. Well, um, there's, there's so much interest in hops nowadays. I mean, IPA is the uh, most popular craft beer style and has been for several years. Uh, there's there's renewed interest in hops given the uh, the couple of books that were published in the last uh, two years. The book on hops by uh, Stan Hieronymus yeah. and the uh, the good uh, IPA book by uh, Mitch Steele. Uh, both highly recommend those books. Um, plus the, uh, the the varieties of hops you can get nowadays is just so much better than it used to be. So uh, it really is a good time for hops. We're over that hop shortage thing, more or less. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in uh, uh, getting good hop character out of your beer. Well, so I thought I'd uh, start the discussion by going sort of in uh, brewing order here. Uh, so let's start with the mash. What are your thoughts on uh, Well, first of all, I can tell us about mash hopping and then uh, perhaps share some of your thoughts on mash hopping. Um, yeah, I'm not, not a fan, but, uh, mash hopping is basically taking some of your hops and putting them in the mash along with your grains. Mm -hmm. Um, that's, that's pretty much what it is. And, uh, my take on it is it's a waste of hops and a waste of money. <laughs> you don't, you don't really get any hop character out of it. I mean, if there's, if there's any bitterness that you get, there's a lot more efficient ways of getting bittering agents out of hops than putting them in the mash so yeah the um, problem, problem is you don't boil it so that bitter bittering agents never get isomerized right yeah um it just doesn't seem to really carry over um there there there's so many other techniques that seem to do more i played with it a few times but um i mean it's kind of like i couldn't tell that it was there so uh, given how much hops do cost, um, I would rather just, just as soon skip it um, and focus on the other techniques. Right, right. Well, uh, let's move on then to uh, right after the mash, which is uh, one of my favorite techniques, first wort hopping. Can you first explain what it is? Yeah, it's one of my favorites too. Um, it's, it's, it's having hops um, in any form in your kettle at the time that you louder from the mash tun. So you're running in uh, your, your fresh, sweet wort right on top of the hops before you even fire up the kettle. So, um, and it uh, sort, of, sort of steeps there, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it steeps before it boils. Right. And, and then the, you, I think you leave it in there, right? Yeah, 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 you leave it in there through the whole boil. So the, the, the counterintuitive thing is we've all been told that um, the longer you boil your hops, the less late hop character it has. But the, the, the sort of the counterintuitive thing is that I find first wort hopping gives you a ton of hop flavor. I actually like the flavor you get out of first wort hopping than you do out of uh, like a 10 or 15 minute addition. Mm -hmm. it, it just seems very smooth. Um, I really like it. It also gives you 
about the same amount of bitterness you'd get for an equivalent amount of time in the boil. Right. But the that's that's measured IBUs, mm -hmm. but perceived IBUs actually seem to be uh, a little less because the um, the quality of the bitterness is better. It's it's a cleaner bitterness. It's not as harsh. So I think you're actually uh, uh, extracting fewer tannins out of the hops. If I had to if I had to take a guess uh, based on what I'm tasting by the time you're done. So um, you know. So overall, you get sort of a smoother, rounder flavor out of it, right? Yeah, yeah. You get you get a you get a clean, smooth bitterness, and you get a big hop flavor. So, um, I mean, there's some batches of beer that I make with just first word hopping. There's some that I make with uh, nothing but first word hopping and all late hopping, nothing in the middle. Um, those are some of the, uh, uh, the techniques that I sort of gravitate to, even for um, bitter beers. Uh, the very last uh, uh, batch of beer I made was an American IPA, mm -hmm. and I used that technique, just first wort and whirlpool hopping wow. only. So just, so just two hop additions, right? Oh, uh, well, there, I, I dry hopped it too. But, right, right, um, right. Yeah, but in, in the boil, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that moves us on next to uh, to boil hop additions. Can you talk about talk for first about what happens when you boil hops? Sure. Um, basically, when you boil hops, you're you're extracting the uh, alpha acids from the hops. Um, that's the uh, the bittering compounds. They get chemically rearranged, uh, or what we call isomerized in the boil. Mm -hmm. uh, um, which makes the, 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 the acids soluble. So um, you just think about it as you're, you're getting the bittering components out of the hops. Um, so that's the first thing. Um, hops also have oils that carry the aroma and flavor compounds, and um, those are volatile, so those do tend to go away, except as the first word hopping, as I talked, some of the flavor can, can stay around if you use that technique. But for, for normal in-the-boil additions, the longer you boil, less of the, the oils that are actually going to persist. So right. you're, you're, through the boil, you're, you're looking for bitterness, uh, flavor, and aroma from the hops. So this is what gives you those IBUs, I guess we call them the bitterness measurement units that we use? Right, right, exactly. Um, so, uh, so you, you definitely add a bittering addition to almost every single, uh, uh, beer you make, right? Because you got to have that bitterness to offset the malt flavor. Yeah, indeed. Um, unless you're doing something that's like a, a Lombeck or something, uh, where you're going to have, uh, a sourness instead of bitterness to offset the, the malt. But, um, a beer would see even if it was fermented dry, it would seem it would seem unnaturally sweet unless it had something there to to, to balance that uh, character. So, Gordon, what are your thoughts on a single bitterness addition versus uh, you know a whole bunch of additions? I know you know early on there was a lot of uh, recipes I found, especially when I started brewing, that had you know almost every five minutes adding another addition. And there's people now doing continuous hopping where they're adding little bits of hops all the way through the boil. Um, what are your thoughts on the merits of that versus uh, just a single addition? Um, I, I, tend to, I tend to use fewer additions, but um, um, sometimes, you know, if I'm using recipe software to calculate a certain bitterness level, sometimes it just kind of works out more evenly to use um, round numbers of hops in different places. Uh, so rather than you know measuring out some precise amount and having something left over, I'm more likely to to um, you know go to whole measures or something that that would use up hops out of a packet in an uh, even amount. So I might fiddle around with where I add them in the boil to make the IBU target uh, come out about right. But I think I think a lot of people use the multiple additions to build up different layers of flavor. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know that's kind of an interesting idea. So if you're if you're you know using a single hop, 
I don't know that you're going to get a whole lot of different character. I mean, obviously, I talked about there being, um, you know, the oils and the hops that go away um, depending on how long they're boiled. Um, so you will wind up with a different mix at the end based on those hop additions. Uh, what I've never really seen is any sort of predictive uh, tool that would say, uh, for this beer, you want to have these kind of additions because, you know, you want these certain chemicals in these certain places. <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think people have gotten to that. So I think, um, you know, if people like just sort of tending to their kettle a lot, then go ahead and add lots of pops to it. But, I mean, I tend to use, um, you know, bigger additions, fewer bigger additions than a lot of continuous hopping. Right. Yeah, I've started to move towards that myself. Um, Gordon, what are your thoughts on, uh, uh, I think I think it was Charlie Papazzi in one of his early books had the idea of a bittering edition, a flavor edition, and then an aroma edition, with a flavor edition sort of being in that, you know, 15-minute, kind of 20-minute kind of range. Um, do you think there's a real difference there, or do you think it's really just sort of a bittering edition and aroma edition? No, I... I I think I think you do get those. I I, I I kind of agree with that. The you know the old school hop technique of mm -hmm. bitter additions, flavor additions, and aroma additions. I I just think that while that's correct, there are also other things that you can do to get bitterness, flavor, and aroma out of hops. Right. Yeah. You know, we already talked about first word hopping as a way of getting uh, additional flavor, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, but. That's not to say that those other things aren't true. It's just it's it's not the full story. Right. So I mean, if you brew a certain way, yeah, that'll work. I mean, you're going to get more flavor out of a, a hop addition and less aroma if you're you know if it's in there between ten and twenty minutes. Right. So I mean, I, I usually my flavor additions are usually ten to fifteen minutes, mm -hmm. and my aroma additions are usually in the last five minutes or less. Right, and that I, that kind of brings me to the next topic, which of course is aroma additions. Um, you know, a lot of recent research indicates that you really shouldn't uh, shouldn't be boiling a lot of these aroma additions. I was wondering if you could talk talk for a moment about that. Yeah. Um, so the aroma compounds in in hops are fairly complex. There there are a number of different chemicals, and each each of the chemicals has a different uh, boiling point. So when the chemical boils, it volatilizes and it goes off into the air and it smells good. So that's good when you're, when you're brewing beer, but not so good when you're drinking the beer later. So um, if you want those oils to be in the beer, then you should generally boil them less. So, um, so what, uh, what are you, what are you, what's your recommendation for aroma ops then? I mean, how do you do it? Yeah, so um, I've kind of gotten away from um, doing, you know, I said before, I usually add aroma additions in the last five minutes. So unless I'm, unless I'm brewing like a German beer where I, I really don't want a fresh hop aroma, well, I, I, do, I do want a fresh hop, but I don't want a grassy hop aroma. Um, yeah, I'll usually add those in at two minutes. Usually, I, I do my aroma additions at uh, knockout, so I turn off the kettle and then I'll add the hops, um, and then I'll let them steep. Um, and why are preserving these aroma oils so important? What do you get from uh, from these significant aroma oils? Uh, beer that smells good. <laughs> you know, it's. Uh, <laughs> It depends on the style of beer you're making. I mean, really, um, it's the it's the quantity of the the, the variety and the quantity of hops that that you're adding. Um, if you're shooting for um, uh, a big hop aroma, then you know I think you should add them late. Now, whether or not you want uh, some of the secondary characteristics out of the hops, um, that's kind of where you care, be careful that. Um, uh, too much of a good thing uh, can start uh, uh, getting bad. Uh, if you add a, a whole lot of hops, uh, you start extracting the uh, sort of the vegetal characteristics out of it, more of the, um, 
the green character, the chlorophyll character, out of the hops. Um, that's not a opinion. Uh, some people kind of like it, um, especially people that dry hop a lot. Yeah. So I tend to not, not dry hop that much because I don't like a lot of that, um, that chlorophyll character. Now, I've, heard, I've heard you can get that grassy flavor from boiling too long as well. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, in, in, in general, you, you extract more bitterness out of hops the longer you boil them, but there is a, a point of diminishing returns. Um, most of the brewing textbooks say don't boil hops longer than 90 minutes uh, because you start um, getting more negative characteristics, whether... Um, there, there's multiple kinds of bittering compounds in hops. Um, we talked about the alpha acids, but there are also these beta acids in there that um, are, are, are harsher. So you, you tend to pick up more of those the longer you boil as well. So just just know that there's a curve, the utilization curve, and it tends to peak, you know, by 90 minutes, you're not really getting anything else after that, and bad things can happen. So I tend not to boil my hops longer than uh, 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yeah, most the longest boil I normally do for, for normal beers is 90 minutes anyway. Right. So, I mean, even if I had hops in there that long, uh, I'm not worried that much about it. I just don't like kind of running up against the edge. So I'd, I'd, I'd kind of like to sort of stay in the the normal range. So um, I don't I don't tend to boil them a, a long time. Well, moving back to uh, to the aroma hops, um, a lot of home brewers, yeah, a lot of professional brewers now have moved to moved to using whirlpool hops. You know, where they're adding uh, hops right. in the hot hot whirlpool at the end. And of course, most home brewers don't have a whirlpool system of any kind, but. Um, but what are some of the alternatives for somebody that, that wants to get that uh, same flavor uh, preserved at the end, of the, you know, after the boil is over? Right. So whirlpool hopping, uh, whirlpool is a piece of equipment that uh, professional brewers use. And primarily it's to separate out the, the hop mass and the, the tube from brewing before you run into a fermenter. I mean, it's just... It spins around and spins around and leaves the right. the heavy the heavy stuff um, in a pile, and it draws off the 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 clearer beer. So it's it's more of a clarifying agent or method. But um, pro brewers have learned that you can actually add hops in the whirlpool uh, while the beer is still hot, and you can get a lot of uh, aroma out of it. So. Um, and the other the other thing about whirlpooling is that pro brewers do it for a long time. Right. So, you know, it's not unusual to hear them say the whirlpool for 45 minutes or more. So, um, I think I've even heard of one or two of them that are making beers with just whirlpool hops without actually putting any bittering additions in. Right, right. So you – that's something that I think isn't really well characterized. Um I've I've seen written in books that you can get utilization up to fifteen percent or so out of a whirlpool, but it doesn't really talk about how long and at what temperature yeah. and whether that's you know dependent on there actually being movement or not. I, I've got plans to run a series of experiments to uh, characterize whirlpool hopping on a homebrew scale. Uh, just haven't gotten around to doing any of those yet. But um, I, I kind of would like to know because I know I know you get a uh, non-zero amount of bitterness out of hops yeah. that you put in the whirlpool. Yeah, and, I think that, that from what I understand, that isomerization process takes place even at the lower temperatures, right? It does. It does, but but it goes um, much slower, right? <laughs> you're right. Um, so that's why. I'd, I'd kind of like to have a temperature graph over time of what what your kettle looks like as as you stop boiling, and then have that sort of mapped against what IBUs you get out of it. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I don't think is well understood. Um, 
but at the last NHC, I did a beer that used first word hopping and a lot of uh, whirlpool hopping, and uh, I had it measured in a, a lab. And the the IBUs came out, uh, you know, quite a bit higher than I was expecting, mm-hmm. uh, uh, um, because the the Whirlpool editions in brewing software sort of generally uh, get represented as zero IBU contribution. Right. So um, that's something I'm working on for the next. It version. ought to be something else, but <laughs> well, good, good. Um, but as you point like out, I, said, I don't know what else it's supposed to be. There's no good research on it, right? And it it there's there's a time component and a temperature component, and if you just say that you're adding whirlpool hops, that kind of implies some kind of method, and um, you know I don't know how long people do it. I normally I normally leave it for at least 20 minutes because uh, on my system, I actually have a false bottom in my kettle. And during that time, uh, all the hop material settles down and forms a nice bed. So I wind up with much clearer wort if I, if I give it a 20-minute stand, even if I don't add any uh, so-called whirlpool hops. So, so going, I don't, going back to my question, you don't have a real whirlpool set up either. You're, doing, you're steeping, right? I am steeping. Yeah. Um, I call it a whirlpool because, um, you know, it's at that step in the brewing process. But, yeah, like exactly what I said, I, I, you know, I turn off the heat, I throw in the hops, and I go away for 20 minutes. Right. So, um, you know, then I come back and, you know, things are all settled out. You You look in there and it looks nice and bright. It's kind of the analogy to um, you know what beer looks like when you pitch your yeast versus what happens after the yeast all flocks out. Yeah. I mean, it goes from being some cloudy mess to being something really clear. So, um, yeah, I I don't move it around. I mean, I have pumps on my system, so I mean, mm-hmm. I could recirculate it, but I'm not sure to what end. Um, because I don't know how much the the physical motion makes a difference to extracting the oils. Um, I'm, I'm kind of more afraid of oxidizing the, the compounds or uh, driving them off just because of the, the physical movement. Uh, if I had a true closed system, then um, you know I'd feel a little bit better about that. But running it through an external pump and then back into the kettle, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'd just rather let it steep. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I like how things smell um, coming out that way. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly a, a lot less trouble. So that's, that's kind of the, that's kind of the modern day homebrewer whirlpool. Right. You know, even if there, there's no movement involved. And like I said, I usually do about a 20 minute steep. And then uh, um, I want, the other method is to use a hop back. Can you talk about what a hop back is? Sure. Um, a hop back is a uh, external uh, piece of equipment that you um, that sits between your kettle and your chiller. So normally you fill that full of hops and then you run the hot work through it. So it's kind of like a whirlpool, except the contact time is a lot uh, shorter because mm-hmm. it's just going through the hops uh, quickly. So I'm not sure that there's a whole lot of difference between using a hop back and, and doing a short steep. So um, I, oh, guess, I guess on my system, um, remember I said I have a false bottom in my, uh, in my uh, kettle. So actually the, the false bottom kind of serves the purpose of a hop back. Because it's it's doing sort of a filtering straining right. uh, technique. Because uh, traditionally the the hop backs would yeah it would give you some hop character, but it would also tend to uh, form a filter right for the beer heading into the chiller. Like an inline inline hop filter. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So you know, I, I get. You know, I actually I actually own a hop back, but I don't use it because I found that doing the twenty minute steep with a false bottom in my kettle gives me, you know, the exact same thing, and it's uh, right. one less thing to clean. 
Well, let's uh, let's move on. So uh, so we're done with the boil now, and we get into fermentation. What are our options uh, for hopping during fermentation? Um, or after well, fermentation? Right. So so this is we're out of the hot side now. We're 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 through the chiller and and the fermenter. So it's it's a cold side addition. So, uh, I mean, really what you're looking at is dry hopping. Mm -hmm. So just taking, taking the hops and introducing them into the fermenter at some, at some stage. Um, traditionally, I'd say what people have done is wait until fermentation is complete and uh, your beer is dropped bright and then you would rack it into a secondary with the dry hops after the yeast has is, is dropped out. That's kind of the traditional way of uh, doing it on a homebrew scale. Um, in Stan Hieronymus's book on hops and some of his talks, mm -hmm. he's actually he actually talks somewhat about um, the, the the yeast transforming some of the hop compounds during fermentation. So he's actually advocating starting dry hopping. Um, while the yeast is still active, you know, perhaps when it's, you know, 90% or 80% done, um, you know, I think, I think if you had to gauge it at home, you know, after the, after the croissant is, uh, you know, uh, started falling, but before the beer is, uh, cleared mm -hmm. to add some in then, uh, you know, it kind of, it kind of depends on the, the kind of fermenter you have. So, like I said, I, I made an IPA recently, and I did a split batch with two different yeasts. And one of the yeasts I intend to reuse on a, on a subsequent batch, and the, and the other yeast I'm not going to. So, um, I dry hopped the not reused yeast batch, but not the one that I'm going to reuse, because I don't want to mix all, these, all the hops in with the yeast that I'm, I'm going to pull out of it. Mm -hmm. So... Um, if I want to dry hop that one, I'm going to do it more the traditional way. I'm going to rack it off the yeast and uh, uh, dry hop there. Now, if you still wanted to do the stand thing, um, you can still rack off the yeast before fermentation is, is finished. So, um, Move it to a secondary or something, tertiary yeah, or something like that. Yeah, move, move it to a secondary while it's still active and, and harvest the yeast off that way or... You know, if I actually brewed in a conical, I could just drop the yeast out of the bottom, like they do in a brewery. But I use carboys, so um, you know that that's that's not an option for me. But you know, think about think about whether you need to do something else with the, the and uh, let that drive where you add it. Mm -hmm. So what are, uh, Gordon, what are some of the effects you see from dry hopping? We talked about, you know, what boil hopping does, what first word hopping does, what aroma hopping does. What is, uh, what do you get from dry hopping? Well, um, you, you're, you're also getting the oils, but um, you're, you're not getting any sort of heat effects on them. So, I mean, I, I, I kind of liken it to cooking. Um, there's a big difference between whether you use spices you know, you throw spices in a pan with some oil and cook them a little bit before you put meat in versus you wait until the, the meal is completely done and then you sprinkle raw spices on it. It's going to taste completely different. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I, I think of this raw spice, cook spice feel. Um, to a certain extent, that's, that's true with hops. So you can get like a raw character versus a cooked character. Um, that's if some of these compounds are present at all. Um, of course, that, we haven't talked much about that, but that, the, the, that varies by variety, doesn't it? Well, sure. The different varieties will have different um, oil content and, and, and composition. Like I said, there's, there's, I don't know how many different ones, dozens of different identified uh, oils that might be present in hops, and each of them have different... Uh, uh, flavor and aroma uh, characterizations. So, you know, if you're trying to emphasize a certain character, um, you know, you might want to use them in the in the different places. Um, some of the, you know, I think about the um, 
the, the sort of the raw character, the green character, the vegetal character that you get out of it. But some of the some of the hop oils actually carry a similar uh, kind of uh, you know, one of the compounds has a, has a very grassy note to it, and that's one of the ones that kind of has a lower boiling point. So you're you're going to tend to get more of it with dry hopping um, as well. So that's it kind of piles on that way. Mm-hmm. So it depends on um, you know whether you want a big hoppy nose or a big grassy fresh hop nose, and and that kind of comes down to personal preference mm-hmm. or the the style of beer uh, you're doing. I think I think the best aroma in beer does use um, some whirlpool hop and some dry hop rather than relying all on one or all on the other. Um, the one of the differences is also that um, your dry hopping after fermentation is mostly complete, so there's actually alcohol present. So you know some of these things are alcohol soluble versus water soluble. So you can pick up different compounds from there as well. So I mean, if you're if you're trying to layer some complexity from hops, I think you get more from both whirlpool and dry hopping. But you can certainly just use one or the other. Um, Gordon, what are your thoughts on contact times? I know that uh, you know a lot of recent research has pushed us towards shorter contact times for dry hopping, but you know yeah. traditional methods. Some people use really long contact times. We even you know, people even put hops in the keg, for example. Yeah, um, well, I mean, putting hops putting hops in a cask is kind of a traditional English method. I mean, that would be that would be actually something that would be done once the cask reached the pub. And that mm-hmm. was one of the, sort of the marks of cellarmanship. Um, you know, they would use hop plugs there because they would, you know, design to fit through the bunghole easily. But um, you know, very English things to do is uh, you dry hop it in the in the cask. But then again, the casks are intended to be served um, sort of present use. They'll, they'll be gone in a couple of days. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there there is a different school of thought. I'm not sure that there's a consensus. It depends on who you choose to listen to. Um, I did a I did a story in Zymergy a while back on, on this, and you know I sort of quoted the you know there's the, kind of the Vinny uh, Treluzzo school, which um, you know advocates a longer dry hop time, and then and the Matt Brindelson uh, uh, school that talks about a shorter time. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure one is better than the other. I think, I think if there is a consensus anywhere is that more than two weeks worth of dry hopping is bad. Um, you know, you, you really want to avoid oxidizing hops, uh, especially these late hops. Um, so Shorter contact times at at kind of room temperature as well. Mm-hmm. It, it's the other kind of thing that people have talked about is looking at the various different temperatures, and it's kind of sort of settled down in the uh, you know sixty to seventy degree range as uh, kind of best for um, getting the the oils out of the hops. Um, but you know, I think if I had to look across. All recommendations that I see that they they do keep getting progressively shorter. So, um, you know, I said before two weeks is kind of the max. I, I think one week um, for homebrewers is probably, you know, kind of the the practical limit. What happens? What happens if you leave too much contact time? I mean, if you leave it too long? Well. Um, you know, there's the chance for additional oxidation, but I think you also start pulling, you know, extra stuff out of the hops. You start pulling more of the vegetal character out of it. Uh, kind of what I liken that to is um, making, you know, if you're made, uh, stick with my English analogies, that, um, you know, you steep your tea for like three minutes or something, you're going to have a good cup of tea. Uh, you steep your tea for 20 minutes, and you're going to have a you know a really astringent mess. So, um, and th- and that all comes 
just straight from the vegetal matter in the in the leaves. So I think the longer that you have the contact time with the vegetal matter, the more you pull out the the undesirable character. I mean, you're really looking you're really looking to get the oils out of the hops. And once you've basically done that, uh, um, you know what else are you getting out of them? Why why should you have these this this stuff in your beer that's already given up their goodness? Um, you know, I, I just as soon get it out before you you know it starts giving up its badness. It's kind of like having uh, you know your yeast in the beer. You know, it ferments out, and uh, you know that's great. And if you leave it too long, it italicizes. Right. So you, you went from getting something wonderful to getting something undesirable. So I think I think you can get that there as well. And then there's uh, there's another school that says twelve to twenty four hours is the peak flavor. What do you think about that? Um. Well, you know, one of the schools is like um, you know three days three days or less. So, like I said, um, you know, it's getting shorter and shorter as to what people say. Um, um, I don't, I don't know that I've looked at literature that sort of shows what percentage of oils, whether there's like a, um, you know, a better extraction of oils, whether you get like most of them in the first 24 hours or not. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, kind of like a first runnings kind of analogy. If you want like the best malt flavor, use the first runnings. I mean, you might give up um, some quantity, but you're 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 getting better quality. So you know, I tend to think that you get the best out of something in the first uh, in the in the first usage. So I mean, that wouldn't surprise me. But there's 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 kind of a way of um, compensating for that. The, the quantity aspect, the diminished quantity aspect, that is, and that's um, doing uh, successive dry hoppings. So you dry hop with something and, you know, you leave it in for the period of time and then you pull it out or, or separate it somehow and then do it again. You know, and you can do that until, you know, you're happy with the, 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 the hop character that you have in the beer. So that's... That's another more modern thing is the is the idea of um, doing multiple dry hoppings and removing the hops after a certain period of time. Well, um, that kind of brings me to another topic we've sort of glossed over here. But um, what do you think about mixing different hop varieties in in the boil and dry hopping in the aroma hopping? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, mixing varieties? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm all for it. I mean. Uh, Again, I'll 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 drop back to a cooking analogy. I mean, I mean, how would you like it if like every meal you made, all you used was allspice? Yeah. You know, I think you'd get kind of tired of that. I mean, you know, you it's it's nice to make a a, a single hop beer sometimes if the the hop has exactly the right character that you want, but um, oftentimes you want to add uh, uh, some complexity. Um, I think I think two hops is great um, a lot of times that you can compensate for uh, one hop shortcomings with another. Um, you know, there's you know talk of famous pairings of hops. You know, the 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 two ones that I like the most. Uh, I've got the old school one, the Cascade and Centennial, mm -hmm. and the sort of more modern one, which is uh, Amarillo and Simcoe. Um, but you know, then there's the even more modern things where you use some of these these emerging hops, some things that um, some things that are great as an accent hop. I'm thinking like a, a Nelson Savon. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had single hop beers of that, and and unless you really like that character, it it just winds up off putting mm -hmm. um, if that's the only hop that's in there. But if you add that in with other hops, it it really adds. Uh, something special. So I think some hops can sort of carry the show and other things are meant to be, um, you know, just, uh, you know, bit players that come in, uh, mm -hmm. but, you know, they'll, they'll wear you out if they're there too much. You know, some hops are kind of like uh, Jim Carrey, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, you can put up with them for 10 seconds, but if you have two hours of them, you know, you're going <laughs> to poke your eyes out or something. Where do you stand on uh, high alpha hops versus uh, you know a lot of the traditional low alpha hops? Yeah, um, 
that's that's kind of like the old ways of thinking about things. Uh, when you talk about um, hops that have certain alphas and characterizing some as bitterness hops and some as Aroma finishing hops. hops. Right, right. I, you know, I think I think that's kind of an outmoded way of thinking about it. I think the way people tend to think about it now is they think about the alpha acid just for bittering, and then it's all about the oil content um, for the 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 rest of the the bits. Mm-hmm. So, um, really, I tend to ignore um, these alpha things because. It used to be that if you got a really high alpha hop, it was gonna it was gonna have a crappy um, uh, aroma and flavor. But that's not true now. Um, no, in fact, a lot of people some of these, a lot of people are using the high alpha hops for finishing, right? Um, absolutely. Like I said, this this last batch of um, IPA I made, I used two hops. I used uh, Australian Galaxy and I used uh, Citra. So I was going for a, a tropical fruit uh, character, and both of those hops were around 13%. So um, you know, it's kind of hard if you want to make a really hoppy, lower-gravity beer because um, it's kind of hard to get those, um, those hoppy notes out of it without pulling too many IBUs. Mm-hmm. So... Um, like I said before, I love I love the flavor contribution I get from first word hopping, but it it brings a lot of bitterness with it too. Sure. So um, you know you kind of have to be careful. Um, but I, I I love these more modern high alpha hops. They have some really uh, great uh, characters. We're mm-hmm. we're in a good time. There's the the craft brewing industry is demanding more interesting hop varieties and the, and the growers are producing them. There's Absolutely. each year, there's something new out there to, uh, to check out and, you know, not all the ideas are good ones, but you, you kind of have to try it to see if you like it. Mm-hmm. Well, can you talk for just a minute about, um, how you sort of match up some of these techniques with the style of beer that you're brewing? Yeah. Um, really when I'm, when I'm choosing hops, um, for a beer, I think about uh, a couple of things. Is um, you know, one is the absolute IBU level of the beer, and the second one is what kind of late hop character does it have. So, if I'm making um, you know a malt-driven beer, I'll tend to use the old-school hopping techniques. I'll put a 60-minute boil, and then I'll put a very light. Um, you know, I'm talking about maybe a half ounce of hops for a five-gallon batch in the last, you know, somewhere in the last 10 or 15 minutes. You know, if I'm doing like a German lager or something that's uh, malty or, uh, you know, an English style that's malty, um, I'll tend to use those traditional techniques. Um, if I'm if I'm going for sort of a hop-focused beer, that's where I said before, it, 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 the, the challenge is... Um, how do you get all the late hop character that you want and still hit your IBU targets? And and challenge, because some of the, the best hops are these high alpha hops, the challenge is now, ironically, um, how do you avoid overdoing your IBU contribution from all the hopping that you're doing in the beer? Mm-hmm. So when I'm formulating a recipe, I, I usually start with the late hops, and then um, once I kind of understand what kind of flavor and aroma I'm going to get out of it, I, I kind of go back to my target IBU level and say, what else do I have to make up? Mm-hmm. And that's where I might look at a bittering addition or, or, or change around some of the other quantities that I'm using. So that, that's kind of how I approach that. Good. Um, well, Gordon, is there else, anything else you'd like to add? Uh, it's just a it's a really it's a really good time for hops. Uh, some of the you know some of the sexiest varieties are 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 hard to come by because they're so popular. But um, there's a lot of other hops out there worth experimenting with. Um, I really enjoy some of the the southern hemisphere hops, the things that are coming out of Australia and New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Um, they're quite interesting, and 
Uh, I'm particularly um, fond of some of these ones that have uh, tropical fruit characters, so I'm playing around with those as well. I think that's a um, that's an interesting area. Um, the only the only other thing I wanted to add was if if you're if you're doing a hop focused beer, um, be gentle with any crystal malts that you use <laughs> because they tend to um, clash with the hops. So, kind of my my uh, my little uh, tagline that I used at the NHC this year is uh, Munich is the new crystal. <laughs> that. Uh, you know, think about where you might have added crystal and try adding Munich instead. You know, go for something that's malty without being caramely sweet. Right. Um, you know, it might it might give you that balance that you're looking for without uh, clashing. Um, I also I also recommend that uh, you you think about a well attenuated uh, beer that residual sweetness tends to to fight with the hops as well in the same way that the, the caramel uh, flavors from crystal malt will. Um, it's something that I see, you know, not so much on the West Coast, but East Coast kind of things. And, and, and also I've been some places in South America where they, they, they tend to make sweeter IPAs. And I, and I notice, you know, they kind of wind up tasting a little bit more like what you'd think an ESB would be in balance. The, the malt just seems sort of high. You know, it's a it's a perfectly fine beer that drinks well, but if you if it, if you really want to enjoy the hops, you need to back off on the the, the malt sweetness. Go with go with a, a simpler malt bill. I tend to use uh, two row and pilsner in kind of equal amounts with mm-hmm. maybe ten percent light Munich uh, thrown in there to give it uh, a little bit more of that richness. Um, Bigger beers, you might you might be adding ten uh, percent sugar to help dry it out because you don't want your big hoppy beers to to be like a barley wine. Um, right. Don't the, too much. Yeah, barley wine. Bar, barley wine is a perfectly fine thing to make, but you know the difference between a barley wine and a double IPA is that uh, you know it's sipping versus drinking. <laughs> so. You know that's it's it's the it's the overall balance impression that you get out of it. So right. those are those are sort of sort of my uh, my favorite tips and cautions for working with uh, hoppy beers. Well, thank you, Gordon. I really appreciate you being on the show. Oh, sure thing. It was great. It was uh, really kind of flew through this. This uh, the time really uh, went fast. It was uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, definitely, definitely glad to have you on the show again and. Uh Again, today's guest was Gordon Strong. He's the president of the Beer Judge Certification Program, three-time three time Ninkazi Award winner, which is the uh, most award-winning uh, uh, person uh, in the United States, pretty incredible, and the AHA Governing Committee Lifetime Achievement Award and author of the excellent book, Brewing Better Beer. Well, a big thank you to Gordon Strong for appearing on the show. Really appreciate him being here. Also appreciate all of you who have been giving feedback for the show on iTunes or feedback for our software or our mobile software on Google Play, on iTunes, or on Amazon. Really appreciate you uh, providing that feedback to us. And also a reminder that you can join our newsletter by going to beersmith.com on the right side. There's a little box there where you can fill in your name and your email address, and we'll start sending you an article on homebrewing every single week. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.